poem is entitled Vietnam, A Legacy in Poetry, um, Poetry on Vietnam, the Vietnam War and Life After will be read by poets, both civilians and former soldiers, commemorating both the 43rd anniversary of the fall of Saigon and the last day of National Poetry Month. To start off our series, um, we will have um, Mr. Vong Vu. Let's give him a nice round of applause as he moves forward here. Um, Vong was born in Saigon in Vietnam. His family immigrated to San Jose in 1979. He studied creative writing at San Jose State and Fresno State University. He is the founder and editor of Terrain Poetry Press and Perfume River Poetry Review. Um, he will read his poem, Famine, about the Vietnamese famine of 1945, an examination of struggles of the Vietnam, of Vietnamese people and their greatest legacy, their resilience and their courage. Please, um, a warm round of applause again for Vong Vu. Okay, so um, when I got the invitation from Deborah, the first thing that I thought about when I heard the word legacy was this one song from the singer um, Jin Kung Sun. Um, and I think that the Vietnamese people here know what song I'm talking about. And so I sort of play a snippet of it because it's actually, um, it's actually uh, part of my poem. And so translated, it's a thousand years of Chinese slavery, a century of French subordination, and 20 years of ruthless war. The legacy, the inheritance mother that you've given to me is a sad Vietnam. And so that is the Vietnam that I come from. That's the Vietnam that I, the culture that I grew up with. And so this poem reflects that. This poem reflects the sadness that my people have always gone through. And I'm at cry. I don't know why. <laughs> okay, this poem is called Famine. There was a drought, a cloud of locusts. There was the Japanese Imperial Army marching into French Indochina in 1944. Farmers were forced to surrender their rice crops. Those who refused were buried alive in their fields. That year ended with a comment, a bad omen written in the sky. When the new year came and crept over the land, famine followed in its shadow. Two million Vietnamese starved that year. I remember from my mother's stories of hunger so real you knew your bones. There was a village where every child died, and there were bodies along the roads, bodies floating down rivers by the hundreds by the day. These are the stories I remember most of my Vietnam, my brave people who have survived one famine after another, who have survived a thousand years of Chinese rule, a century of the French, who have survived one war after another, one backbreaking rice harvest after another, and now when I sit down to eat a bowl of rice, I bow my head. The grains of rice in that bowl like beads of precious stone, as white as polished bone. Thank you. Thank you. Our next um, two poets will present in both English and Vietnamese. Um, they will be presenting Vietnamese folk poems um, written under the communist regime. The two poets um, 
Win Tan Xuan and Jin Wen are presenting the poems Cao Dao. Let me just um, tell you a little bit about our poets, our presenters. Win Tran Chin was born in 1945. In 1954, Chin Win and his family moved from North to South Vietnam. In 1968, he joined the South Vietnamese Air Force and remained there until 1975. He came to America in 1975 as a refugee. He worked for 30 years as an engineer for IBM. He is president of Van To Lac Viet, the Vietnamese Literature Society in San Jose, and enjoys his retirement by writing poetry. Win Tan Xuan, a.k.a. Suan Kacha, um, came to the United States in 1977. She's the author of two books, A Road to Wealth and Happiness and The Secret to Success. We're all going to go after that, those two books afterwards. She is currently the secretary of Van To Lac Viet, a Vietnamese literature organization in San Jose. Please give a big round of applause for our two poets. I think you talk first. Good afternoon, everyone. As you all know, today is the day of all Vietnamese. Never forget. April 30th in 1975. Now that is called is Black Pride, uh, Black April, the day that the Vietnamese had lost the country to the communists and the last, the fall of Saigon. And today I'm honored to participate in this program at Vietnam, the legacy in poetry. First of all, Kaya Vietnam or Vietnam Pop Poetry as translated by John ba Balaban are being composed by ordinary person who pass on the poem orally. Mr. Lak Balaban defies Kayao is always lyrical, sung to the melody without instrumental, accompanied by an individual singing in the first person, not the narrative, the third person, or a traditional oral and is passed on epic poetry in the West. Gayao is loosely defined. Ga is Vietnamese oral, uh, mean song. Yao means a short, unfixed melody, uh, anonymous. Poem song with, without fixed melodies. Transmitted um, by Hak Hong Ko Chin Khuk, transmitted to orally long before they were transcribed into paper. Kayao can be characterized as a form of folk poetry as well as folk music. It is not uncommon for many Vietnamese folk songs also be folk po poems and vice versa. Vietnamese poetry is unique because of its intense melding of the poetry and music, the words, the rant, the alliteration, the rant create a musical quality resulting into a poem song. Kayao is sung rather than read and recited. Its unique performance characteristic distinguishes its other poetic forms. Today, as we celebrate Vietnam, the legacy in poetry, we would like to present to you some of the Vietnamese folk poetry before and after the fall of Saigon in 1975. The first Ca Yao was probably composed in North Vietnam. The North Vietnamese were used to eat cassava um, instead of rice under the communist regime why the southerner eating rice. However, after the communists took over the whole country, everyone continued eating cassava. 
peace of home. Excuse me. The poetry that I'm reading had to many time different sound. So I think I can read <coughs> the Vietnamese title so you can understand how the sound Vietnamese reading the poetry. Okay. The first thing I read tonight. Ai sinh ra cách của mì? Hỏi, để làm gì? Đáp, để mà ăn. Nước nhà mãi mãi khó khăn. Dân mình mãi mãi phải ăn của mì. That's the one thing I just read for you. To be translated in English, it is the he who created Cassava roots. The question asks, what's the use? The answer is for food. The state is always in dire situation. The people must always eat cassava roots. Ho Chi Minh was the president of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam from 1945 to 1969. He passed away on September 2nd, 1969. The following Kayao was heard in Hanoi first, the capital, about the inflation rise of the rice after his death. When Uncle Ho was alive, rice was one dung at 30 cents a kilo. Since his death, the price was high to three and four dung. Now, under the rings of Mr. Yuan and Mr. Dao, Rai is also scarce, even the seven and eight dung a kilo. Translate. I translate to the Vietnamese. Bác Hồ sống gạo ba đồng. Từ khi bác mất, ba đồng. Từ khi bác mất, gạo ba bốn đồng. Đến nay bác duẩn bác đồng gạo bảy gạo bảy tám đồng chẳng có mà ăn. Do mình nói tiền tự ít. Em Nguyễn Văn Thiệu was the president of South Vietnam from 1965 to 1975. Em Nguyễn Cao Kỳ was the vice president of South Vietnam since 1967 to 1971. The third Kayao was from the north. By listening secretly to the radio broadcasted from the south, some of the northerner was able to know that is a southerner could buy anything that they wanted, while they themselves to buy something small like a nail they had to register saying how many they needed, for what purpose, and stood in line for hours hoping to be able to buy down to Pew. So um, this is a poem that we heard. Another kind of opera Vietnamese reading. Đã đau thiệu kỳ mua gì cũng có. Hoan hồ, Hồ Chí Minh. Mua cái đinh cũng xếp hàng. So, translate to Dao Tu Thiệu Kỳ. You can buy whatever you please. Bravo, Hồ Chí Minh. Buying even a nail, you have to be in life. The Communist Party during the 20th and the 21st century freely changed their constitution. Their slogan was, the party conducts the government manage, the people are the owners. The last Kayao show in the one party country at the end of the day, it's the people who suffer the most. This is the poem. I read only three, three words because we have one vow. Đảng chỉ tay. Quốc hội giơ tay, mặt trận vỗ tay, nhà nước ra tay, 
Nhưng mà thành sát miền dữ vậy Dân trắng tay nói thịt It is translated the, po the party point finger The assembly raise hand The front applause The government rock The people suffer the total rock And now here is a two poem written in San Jose recently by Jin Nguyen. You know my poetry. Talk about pho. You know the pho, right? Who who know the pho? You eat a pho already, right? So now I have a poetry about pho. Pho ngon nhờ nước sương hầm, lá mùi húng quế, ớt tương châm vào. Hành trần mới tuyệt làm sao Lênh đênh thịt tái ngọt ngào miệng ăn Gâu, Gân gầu chín nổi lăn tăn Lại thêm bánh trắng không ăn nhịn thèm Việt Nam sáng pháo Men quen. In English, I cannot sing like him, but it was translated because everybody know pho, right? Pho is rich in beef bone broth, fragrance leaves of basil, chili dipping sauce, lightly cooked onions, somehow elevated in flavor, thin slice of rare beef are sweet to the taste, tender and good brisket, stripped in the pot. Then you crave for the white rice noodle. If you don't eat them, you will see them and crave. Pho is the morning and is a joy that you should know very well. I have the honor to read another poem uh, first. And this poet, poet is Ngo Đình Trương, and he made this poem for this April 2018. And he cannot be here today because he has hurt his uh, foot. So I'm going to take his place and read his poem for him. The uh, title of the poem is When. As if the will of God, we've been thrown into same lot. The black April exodus, the, the indignity we could never forget. The Northern Communist Army is Villiers North Company looting, plundering, when the entire population in the South becoming prisoner of some sort. Those prey are dignified. Committing suicide. The cowards are prisoners, showing their blood. 43 years have passed, persecuted and suppressed. Oh, democracy, is there a fanhood? Now, the last one I sing. Vận trời di tản gặp nhau đây. Mỗi hận trong tâm mãi nhớ ngày Giác bắc khác chi bầy trộm cướp Miền Nam toàn thể cánh tù đầy Những người trí dũng coi thân hạt Mấy đứa nu manh lộ mặt dày Sáu mặt Sắt máu bốn ba năm chẳng đổi Bao giờ dân chủ đến tầm tay Thank you, quý vị No Din Chuang came to America in 1975, and he continues to write poetry in both English and Vietnamese. 
So please tell him that we missed him here, and we hope that um, when we have another poetry event that he will come and join us and be in good health. Okay, so thank you again. Beautiful, beautiful language. Our next poet is um, Carol Steele, um, who is not a veteran. Her parents were both World War II veterans, and her husband was a Vietnam veteran. Her grandson is currently serving in the Army. She has been keeping a record in lyrical poetry and haiku for 11 years. Of the family experience in the military while well, having loved one in the military during a time of war. She studied with Ellen Bass for eight years and with Yuki Teiki Haiku Group for 18 years and is a member of uh, Veterans of Life Right, which, by the way, meets here in the library on the first Fridays of the month. Her poem is Helicopter OH-6867-1619. Um, her poem serves um, to honor the memory of Albert Danny Owens, killed in action from an incident on 6-8-1969 while performing the duty of pilot of a helicopter. He was killed. He was only 21.6 years of age. His home city was in Mount Shasta, California. Um, let's give a big round of applause for Carol Steele. Thank you. Helicopter OH 6A 67-16-162. Danny Owens was stationed on a ship on a river in Dongtown, South Vietnam. Awakened in the night, he rolled out, pulled on his uniform, and took the stairs two at a time to the flight deck. Our soldiers on shore were under fire. He climbed in the cockpit, started the aircraft, was given the thumbs up, and lifted off. His mom sat in the top row of the bleachers in school baseball game, screaming cuss words at him. He was 6'2", with blue eyes and brown hair, strong and kind to me. When my boyfriend and I broke up, Danny and I spent hours in his 57 baby blue Chevy driving the high Sierra Mountain roads. I don't remember what we said as much as how comfortable I felt next to him. The year I moved away from Mount Shasta for work, Danny came to visit. He, we stayed up that night in his motel room, sitting on the brown patterned bedspread, leaning against the headboard, talking. He said he loved me, was signed up for the service, but wouldn't go if I married him. In the morning, we stood in the parking lot, soft yellow light surrounded him, and hugged goodbye. We talked on the phone a couple of times, and then I didn't hear from him. The report says he lifted off, hovered, and when he should have gained airspeed, lost altitude. The skid skimmed the water, the helicopter tipped forward and crashed, sinking rapidly. They sent two planes searching all night, but couldn't find him or his chopper. It was years before I heard how he died. My first thought was, I wish I had made love with him. At least he would have had that. Now, alone a long time and still remembering, I wish we had made love. At least I would have that. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Our next poet is Jeffrey Leonard. Jeffrey is a 12th generation American. His ancestors have fought in every major war on this continent and several others. In 1966, Jeffrey was drafted into the U.S. Army, where he rose to sergeant at Fort Carson, Colorado. By 1968, he was honorably discharged for his service and returned to San Jose State University. He has been an elementary 
school teacher for the past 32 years. He is co-facilitator of PS PCSJ's Veterans of Life Right, which again, another plug, meets um, the first Friday of every month in this library. Jeffrey's poem is Vietnam War Dream. Uh, Jeffrey is engaging dream energy in this poem to consider this war that played such a significant role in his life and the millions of his fellow citizens. Please welcome Jeffrey Leonard. It is such an enormous honor to be here at the school in which I was drafted out of, returned to, and had this opportunity to read my poetry. I can't tell you how deeply honored I am. Thank you for making this available. The backstory, uh, very quickly, is on May 11th, my high school friend and college roommate, who was matriculating here with me, um, crashed in a helicopter and out of now. Archibald McClish, the poet, in a poem that he read called The Young Dead Soldiers, instructs us to find meaning in their lives. And so that's what I've tried to do with my dead friends legacy. So, this poem um, is inspired by, by dream, and uh, using dream energy and the theme of today's uh, poetry. Carl Marlantis is a Marine officer who wrote a number of books, and a quote from him is, War is society's dirty work, usually done by kids cleaning up failures perpetrated by adults. I had a dream last night, unlike any dream I've ever had. I found myself standing before the Lincoln Memorial, examining the mournful countenance of Abraham. When a tall soldier in his early 20s stood beside me, placed his right hand on my shoulder. Something I want you to see, he softly invited. I turned as he instructed to view over 58,000 men in uniform, beaming broad smiles arranged in a kind of relaxed formation. Surrounding them were sweethearts, wives, fathers, mothers, children, all with breathtaking bouquets of flowers, fragrancing the area in which they stood. I suddenly recognized the soldier who had prompted this occasion. It was Tom Bergren, my old college roommate, shot down in a helicopter, May of 68. Yet here he was to showcase this gathering of Marines, soldiers, airmen, and sailors. He saluted over to an assembly of older men to present themselves to all. Gradually, I recognized former presidents, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson. Nixon was nowhere to be found. They shook my hand, broadcasting great satisfaction that these gathered warriors and their families were now saved by virtue of political clarity and goodwill. 
Then a great wind tore through the Doric temple. Down the steps, gust ripped the flowers from the hands of loved ones, sending petals in a gyre of confusion and pain. The sky suddenly darkened. Nixon emerged from behind a column, claiming he had a plan to end the war in Vietnam. He was opposed to the war, but to win the election, he needed the war to continue. He ordered the 58,000 plus men in uniform to gather in front of the Vietnam War Memorial. There they were instructed to read their own names etched in marble. The sweethearts, wives, fathers, mothers, and children wept openly, stretching their arms out, a desperate attempt to grasp their military loved ones, only to observe each soldier, marine, sailor, and airman, even my old friend Tom, dissolve into black stone, leaving only names. 58,272 names. Nixon boarded a helicopter and flew off. A tall shadow moved slowly toward me, excluding Abraham Lincoln joined. Abe was tired of looking down from his marble chair, stiff from the rigors of presiding over a long civil war. Lincoln's face bore the scars and lines of dead men. Then in a tired voice, he lamented, the Temple of Mars is to be entered into slowly, carefully, prudently. You struggle with the situation, approaching the sacred in its terror. He read the endless names on the wall, name after name. Finally, Abe turned to me to ask a question. He repeated it three times. Have we learned anything? Have we learned anything? Have we learned anything? Maria Wynn will next present um, her poem on the Viet Museum in San Jose by Tian Fan. Since 1980, Maria Wynn has enjoyed promoting Vietnamese culture and language to the mainstream by presenting Viet poetry in English. She hopes to bridge the communication gaps amongst Viet generations. Please welcome Maria Wynn. Just want to uh, correct a little bit. This poem is written by my ESL students. Uh, at Vivo, and she wrote it in Vietnamese because she wanted to uh, commemorate the place that she's volunteering. Here at the History uh, Park at San Jose, there's a Viet Museum in there. So I'm going to go ahead and read her Vietnamese part first, and then later I will read my translation of her poem. San Jose có Viet Bảo Tàng, nơi mà lưu trữ môn ngàn văn chương. Việt Nam hai tiếng quê hương để cho con cháu noi gương sau này. Con ơi, mau chóng chớ chạy, hãy mau tiến bước nơi này xem qua. Nhìn lại tưởng nhớ ông cha, gắn công gìn giữ quê ta thủa nào. Cùng chung ba giọt máu đào, trẻ con chung sức, sống sao trọn tình. Tiếng Việt là tiếng quê mình, hãy học cho giỏi. Thấm tình quê hương. If you notice, when we were talking, somehow 
there's already the melody in there because we have five accents. So you thought that we were singing, but actually we we're just talking. <laughs> but for the poems that we are doing, it's called uh, Look Back. Look means six and back means eight. And that's what uh, Mr. Jing and, and Ms. Uh, Tang Xuan were, um, you know, recited for you earlier. Because those are like anonymous. We don't care who's the, the original uh, poet, but it's so down to us that it's funny. And because things is anonymous, nobody can accuse you of saying bad words or whatever. <laughs> but anyway, because there's uh, like you have a formula, just like a haiku, you have to be following a certain construction to make a, a poem beautiful. But hers is six by eight. So that's why when you hear we're, we're saying, recite the poem. Of course, my Vietnamese is not as great as Mr. Ching Nguyen. He knows how to recite in a, in a singing voice. But anyway, so because of all these restrictions when you write Vietnamese poem, you were able to, to see there's a little songs in there. And um, here's a translation. San Jose has Viet Museum where thousands literary archives store. Vietnam, our beloved fatherland. Children, you need to hurry. Quickly march on to look at this place. In memory of your fathers, trying to protect our country in the old days. We are you know, of the same blood. You we need to unite to live a fulfilled life. Vietnam is our language. Learn to speak well to connect with the motherland. Um, one thing about, have, have you guys, beside the two Vietnamese here, have you ever seen the Viet Museum at his, History San Jose? <laughs> There's, if you can go, they, they have one, uh, I think one uh, American flag and one Vietnamese flag flown all the time. And it's a yellow house if you drive by on Central Road. The, the nice thing about this is that with someone that have absolutely no Vietnamese background at all. You can see all handmade stuff or the true uh, war artifacts that we see. I remember the things that really reminded me a lot of how we were brought over here. On one of the wall on the first floor, you see there are like four prisoners clothing, uniform, when you're prisoner clothing. And then there's a like a, a, a piece of paper about this size that say the reason why you were permitted to get out of jail and your reason for being in jail because you are, let's say, uh, you're a major in the South Vietnamese Army. Something like that depends on your rank. And depend, the higher your rank, the longer you stay. When at first, when after South Vietnam fall, um, you are supposed to be report for 10 days re-education only, but it turns out some 17 years. But anyway, the four, four of the uh, pictures frames with the prisoner clothing, there's a piece of the paper, the, the, the reason why you able to get out. And then you will see another two pictures frame with the gown, one is high school, one is um, from college. And another piece of paper, that one signified that the pair usually is the father in the army. He had to, he had to suffer three or more years in order to come to United States. And because of that piece of paper, he was able to bring the kid. And because of looking at how, how hard work, the suffering, both the mom and the dad, the, the children were able to get that special gown. So that's why there's a, an exchange of the gown from the prison to the gown in America. And then there's one, one um, on, on the same wall, that's the, the, the clothing up and top, and then down below, there's uh, the artifacts that it say something like a day in the prisoners. You see a guy, um, how he eat in the giggle camps 
if, if you are Vietnamese veteran, you probably know. It's a, a container about this long. They use it to cook rice, to cook soup, to drink water from it. And then for him to forgot all his sorrows, he used that same pen to maybe smoke uh, tobacco with a bamboo, uh, uh, piece of, of bamboo. I don't know how they do it because it's all smoke to me. But anyway, <laughs> and then in order to keep their mind clear, they have to meditate. So it's like one day in the prison should go in. And another one that really strikes me, I'm going to be done real soon, okay? <laughs> On the wall, there are four different kinds of guns. Two were provided to the communists by the, the Russia, by Russia government and also by the Chinese government. On another side, the two guns the South Vietnamese um, uh, soldiers used from France, from America. So none of those guns belong to us. We, we don't make those, but it's from like giant countries. So it's, it got to the point where, who are we? Mm -hmm. We are the one that have poetry. We're, we're simple, but because you know, there are situations where because of idealism from communists, that's why I guess we're here, right? We want the freedom. So that's why we try to get out of Vietnam and this is all the culture we want to, to promote to our kids to make sure that they don't forget that this is what we want to pass it on. And I'm really glad that uh, recently we heard from um, from Senator of um, Janet Nguyen from the California state that she passed, uh, she was able to pass through the educational committee where she, she asked if we can teach our kids, not just Vietnamese, but the kids from elementary, middle school, high school, and perhaps college of why the Vietnamese came over here. Hopefully it will pass at the Senate, but just to let you know what's going on, what we are trying to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Next, uh, we have poet Jack Wells. In January of 1967, Jack graduated from San Jose State majoring in finance and accounting. He reported for active duty for the 21-week, six officers basic school class at Quantico, Virginia in June 1967. And then Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and then Camp Pendleton before being sent to Da Nang, in July 1968 to serve as an artillery forward observer for the 7th Marines. He has returned to Da Nang on several occasions for humanitarian programs for the East Meets West Dental Office in Da Nang. Jack Wells is doing a lot of good um, for the country and the people of Vietnam. Please welcome Jack as he reads Memories by Tom Song. The poem I'm going to read is written by a classmate of mine who lives in Ohio, and he's very flattered that uh, I'm able to read his poem in, in front of the group. And... Uh, Tom was a Marine platoon commander in central Vietnam, Da Nang, in 1968, and had the trauma of having five of his friends die that same year. And the title of his poem is called Memories. It's been a long time, almost 40 years, dark nights, followed by even darker days. Jack, Tom, Henry, Bill, and John. 
each gone, their faces forever etched in the mirrors of my mind. It's been a long time. Jack, whose life ended with the explosion of a landmine. Tom, the same, only days before rotating home. Henry and Bill, each taken by friendly fire, a short round before either had time to react. And John, killed instantly by an AK-47 round to his heart while crossing a rice paddy. It's been a long time. Woeful women, wounded by eyeless bullets, during fearsome firefights. Charred children burned beyond belief by napalm. There are many truisms in life. One, originating during the, during the turbulent 60s, uh, reads, war is not healthy for children and other living things. Add to that, Sorry sights seen in combat remain locked in the mind forever. And that was from Tom Fox. Thank you, Jack. Our next poet is Harry Adams. Harry Fontelle, Fontenelle Adams served in the Air Force during the Vietnam War. He was active in opposing U.S. involvement in the war with many other veterans and active duty military. Currently, he is a member of Veterans for Peace. Harry rediscovered his love of reading and writing poetry and has begun to share his work at open readings and in occasional submissions. Harry is also a participant in Veterans of Life right at the library. His poem is Veterans Day. Let's give a big warm hand of welcome to Harry Adams. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, I actually wrote this poem around about 1985, so rather than construct a new poem, I wanted to bring forth how certainly I was feeling and many Americans were feeling some 10 years after the war. And Veterans Day, the poem is dedicated to all those who seek healing, peace, and reconciliation. And this poem was, was written in sorrow and also with some relief about 30 years ago after viewing the simply etched Vietnam Memorial Wall in its first year of its, of its existence. Some relief because I thought it was over, glad that it was over, never again perhaps, not knowing yet the full cost of three million dead would continue to grow and many more wounded and traumatized for life. Land scorched, land poisoned, people scorched, people poisoned, not knowing yet that we, this nation, would not learn as we continue to go to war endlessly. Now the poem itself, Veterans Day, 1985. The pinwheel clicks Furiously, as a dark-haired boy runs past me, past the marble wall, and past the red-jacketed tourist. He runs so fast that his shadow is barely cast on the wall, and the three colors of the pinwheel become one. Though the November day is hot and muggy, the cherry trees are stripped for the winter and the boy won't be stopping to blow on the blossoms. Now, remembering these other two boys run quickly past the corner store, past Sacred Heart, 
and onto the macadam playing fields of the junior high. Another week's allowance spent on good and plenties and an afternoon at the Strand. The pinwheel is held by one as the other polishes off the last swigs of the shared soda. Talk is of the movie of an hour ago of John Garfield as he once again fought the war and triumphed. In the theater, it didn't matter which parish we came from. All boys whooped and cheered their joy in unison. Now this boy circles around and comes again towards me. Flags whip in the wind. Flowers of every color are placed here and there. Mementos of unknown significance occasionally touch the black marble. We are both here and I want to touch your name, but it is cold. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Dale Barnett is our next poet. Dale was raised in San Jose, joined the Air Force for a stint. He's been married for 28 years and has three children. He lives in Morgan Hill and has been writing since 2009. He has self-published three books and is also involved with Veterans of Life, Poets in Play, and San Jose and Yosemite Poetry Festivals. He also writes for Healing at the South San Jose VA Clinic. Dale will present his poem, Black and White. Please welcome Dale. Protesters didn't march down my middle-class street. Boy Scouts on paper drives brought everyone out. Kids playing war games, perhaps in training, oblivious to the news. Space program shot through our black and whites. Nothing about conflicts, not on kids' prime time. Shows, leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best, Bonanza, kept our young minds focused. I heard about the draft in passing. I heard Cassius Clay was a coward. These thoughts haunt me to this day. No guns on my street, except my to toy Tommy gun and the one who killed President Kennedy. Our teacher cried. We looked on as the flag was lowered. Men landed on the moon as promised. Not all would see. A limited view, not to shatter my boyhood dreams. Tons of paper with truth just collected. I didn't read. If the truth was there in black and white. Thank you, Dale. Our next poet is Doug Nelson. And Doug um, just flew in from his vacation. You were in Hawaii? Australia. Australia. Oh, my goodness. He literally just flew in to be with us today. Um, so he did not receive my um, emails uh, requesting a bio. So he's going to introduce himself, and he's going to introduce his poem. I just want to say um, one thing about Doug. He, he wrote a book about um, dealing with the VA um, for all veterans to benefit them so that they um, would be able to collect claims for PTSD. 
Dale used to work. I'm sorry. Doug used to work for the VA, and um, this book has been checked out numerous times, and um, he presented at our uh, local lit festival, and he just uh, gave his book away. He's got a good heart. He's got stamina to fly in here um, from Australia. Please let's welcome Doug Nelson. And here from a foreign country these days, it takes an hour and a half to get through passport control. That's even with a new automated system. Uh, I'll be brief. For those of you who know me, mercifully brief. I was no war hero. I was a scared, skinny kid. And I had some things happen in Vietnam that uh, I tried to sweep under the psychic rug. And I didn't start to deal with this until I moved here in um, 2007. And actually, the job that uh, she was referring to was uh, what helped me uh, get myself straight. And I thought, man, I'm dealing with the same things these guys are. These are two short, fairly short ones. My country. Ken Burns shook overripe peaches out of my tree so that a soggy thump reminded me that when I came home from over there, people acted as if they didn't know me, and I think I no longer knew them. My comments about the children in my photos were met with, well, they're all just communists, right? I mean, this is Virginia, okay. Um, or they don't value human life the way we do. As a child, I found a Nazi belt buckle in my father's army box that said, with words in a wreath, Gott mit uns. Dad said, God wasn't with them, was he? But I had to wait 50 years before the elfin man and the nice lady behind the video mixer confirmed for me that I fought for nothing and that Ben and Chris died in vain. Our leaders were either clueless or liars. I had suspected as much all along. I don't know my country anymore. The N-word is once again acceptable where I came from. They used to tell this adolescent boy that Jesus was sad when I looked at girls with lustful thoughts. And the other preachers tell me I'm going to hell for not accepting the casino king is my country's savior. They have exchanged the torch the lady in the harbor holds for an extended middle finger, and the clown with the orange hair is no longer funny. The path of least resistance. I prefer welcome home to thank you for your service. Agreeing to being used in Vietnam was a choice that contained the benefit of less pain for taking an easier route, not having to change countries or go to jail, at a cost of annoying dissonance, like an open G chord with one untuned string. On this 50th anniversary of Me Lai, for every person ambushed, bombed, shot for no reason, or made homeless, for every veteran who has taken his own life. And realizing when I and other veterans visited the Veterans Wall in Washington, D.C. to meet a delegation of Vietnamese who had invited veterans to join them in a humble request that our country assist them with the effects of Agent Orange, that a wall to honor the Vietnamese dead would have to stretch from this wall to my family's kitchen table in Richmond, Virginia, where my dad a combat veteran of World War II, advised me not to go because this thing just doesn't look right. And because those people haven't done anything to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug.
my next poet and the last on our program is Emilio Gallego. Emilio is a U.S. Marine Corps and Operation Iraqi Freedom Veteran, a Purple Heart recipient, and is currently a student at San Jose State University, completing an English degree with a concentration in creative writing. Once returning home from Iraq, his experiences found a voice through writing therapy at the Palo Alto VA Polytrauma Rehabilitation Center. He currently serves as a Vet Connect peer leader on the San Jose State campus. He is also a member of Veterans of Life Right, and he has been a participant in the San Jose Poetry Festival in 2016 and 2017. Emilio will be reading two poems, one by Adrian Mitchell, To Whom It May Concern, regarding the Vietnam War. This will be followed by an untitled poem, a piece that pays tribute to a collection of inspirations and post-Iraq life of personal experience. Please let's welcome and we'll look at this. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to play the first poem because Adrian Mitchell sounds better reading it on YouTube than I sound. And he has a cool accent, so it sounds okay. Um, I'll briefly read um, about the poem, I mean, about the poet. It's a collection of poets, if you look for it on YouTube, um, reading um, in the International Poetry Incarnation in Royal Albert Hall in London, 1965. And it's called uh, To Whom May Concern. And it was a good opportunity, this situation, because I never really went looking for, for uh, read or, or be it po poetry read about Vietnam. So we wanted to pair the two, our personal poetry, with poetry written about that time. And so it was awesome to be able to search and, and do some things, put some stuff together, and there's so many things to choose from. This spoke to me a lot, just because I, I like the way it's put together, and I could relate to a lot of things. And... and um, the way his poem works is it's still relevant today because I'm not sure if it's still alive, but he still read it in his, these recent years. And he changes a lot of the verbiage to, to say, um, to insert Iraq, to insert Afghanistan, to insert Libya, because these same truths still exist consistently today. So uh, this is Adrian Mitchell reading To Whom It May Concern, uh, Tommy Lies About Vietnam. To Whom It May Concern. I was run over by the truth one day, ever since the accident I have walked this way. So I stick my legs in plaster, tell me lies about Vietnam. Heard the alarm clock screaming with pain. Couldn't find myself, so I went back to sleep again. So fill my ears with silver, stick my legs in plaster, tell me lies about Vietnam. Every time I shut my eyes, all I see is planes, made a marble phone book, carved all the names. So coat my eyes with butter, fill my ears with silver, stick my legs in plaster, tell me lies about Vietnam. I smell something burning, hope it's just my brains. They're only dropping peppermints and daisy chains. So stop my nose with garlic. Coat my eyes with butter, fill my ears with silver, stick my legs in plaster, tell me lies about Vietnam. Where were you at the time of the crime? Down by the cenotaph, drinking slime. So chain my tongue with whiskey, stop my nose with garlic, coat my eyes with butter, fill my ears with silver, stick my legs in plaster, tell me lies about Vietnam. You put your bombers in, you put your conscience out, you take the human being and you twist it all about. So scrub my skin with women, chain my tongue with whiskey, 
stop my nose with garlic, fill my ears with silver, stick my legs in plaster, tell me lies about Vietnam. And so, like I said, you can still find like, online um, him reading more recently, and he'll read his, his poem, and he'll insert Tommy Lies about Afghanistan, Tommy Lies about Iraq. And so, it's very much, it touched me in that sense. A lot of things he spoke about, though not specifically totally right on, but I had a lot of, I like to say, I'm, I'm, I've been totally, consistently expert level with the wrong coping mechanisms in my life. <laughs> And so, um, you know, uh, uh, drinking, dating, womanizing, regressing from things in my life when I should have been trying to be better. But that's what helped me feel better, working out, trying to get this, something to do with this. And so it's been awesome to recognize where I need to be and where I'm trying to be. And this group's been awesome. And so thank you for being here today. Um, my poem is untitled, and it begins with the epigraph. Um, so, there must be some kind of way out of here, said the joker to the thief. There's too much confusion. I can't get no relief. And that's all along the watchtower of Jimi Hendrix. It changed my life, English literature, and I'm not even sure I knew it then. But when Tennyson spoke, he awoke some thing in me. And I could see heavy ink while I was sinking further into my chair. And the air seemed eerie. Wearily reading along to the song of men. Sweet music of tired eyelids upon tired eyes. And I realized that there is, in fact, confusion that is worse than death. Trouble on trouble, pain on pain. He was saying what I was feeling. Silently reeling in this newly formed place, struggling to embrace the disgrace of not finding a way to say I'm okay and mean it. There is confusion worse than death. I know because it snatched my breath, sped up my heart, and part of my left eyebrow disappeared in 2009. Everything wasn't fine and I trembled in my sleep. That was something that she didn't keep from me. And while she is an important to this written collection of words, she heard me groan and jerk while my mind worked, eyes closed tight, struggling with another fight, still at work in me. The charmed sunset lingered lower down in my red west, and it would come and go, the pain in my chest. I wanted to run and run and run to nowhere and stay there. Tis hard to settle order once again. I remember when my insides didn't feel so bizarre, always wanting to drive myself to the ER. Flying over 80, north on 280. I still think about dying when I'm crying on the inside. Eyes wide shut, somewhat blind to the fact that depression is real and constant regression will steal your joy and destroy you from the inside out. I'm inside out. Thank you.